Right, I think uh, we're off. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, thank you to our guests here, Mr. Davi Ruert, Mr. Lumkile Mondi, Mr. Magnus Heistek. These truly are uh, some of the foremost uh, economic thinkers and economists in South Africa and their insight on today's topic. Uh, we're looking very much forward to exploring that a bit further. To everyone joining us on Facebook, all our friends, Thank you very much for joining us. This is the important uh, service that you can uh, tune into. We are trying to get these arguments, get common sense, get the data, get you know the proper arguments, proper analysis out there, so that we can you know uh, to use the hashtag of the Friends of the IRR campaigns movement to live free. Now, without any further ado, let us uh, begin with a few opening remarks, but I think I could perhaps trigger these remarks by a very, very simple question that I will put to Davi to you first, and then Mr. Mondi, and then uh, Mr. Haystek. Why, looking at today's, you know, our, the topic of this discussion is how will EWC affect hashtag your budget, you know, the budget of ordinary South Africans. Why is the issue of expropriation without compensation, EWC, why is it something that an economist can speak about. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite. Um, I think certainly economists are the right people to talk to when you talk about the expropriation. And the reason why I say so is because there's a saying in economics that says that the, there is no free lunch. I disagree with that. I believe there is a free lunch. And let me explain to you where that free lunch is. And if we undermine this free lunch, then economies will not grow. And a free lunch is simply trade. And think a little bit about that. The reason why person A will trade with person B is because person A and person B will both gain from trade. Because if I didn't gain from trade and B didn't gain from trade, we would not have traded. So trade is the only real free lunch where both parties gain. Unfortunately, well, in, in fact, fortunately, the only way that we can affect trading between individuals. The only way that we can support that and the only way it can be sustained is if people have stuff to trade with one another. And that means that if you do not have ownership of something, you cannot trade. And if you don't have ownership of something, you don't trade, you do not gain from this only real free lunch in the economy. And that's why it is so absolutely crucial. In fact, I would go as far as saying that private property rights is the beginning of this thing that we call the economy. Because without that, the free trade and the free lunch is not possible. Lungile is... Uh Oh, on how many points is, uh, is Darvi wrong here, or is he on, to coin a phrase, the money? Uh, so Darvi forgets the, the questions of power, that in the exchange, there are power relations. So in those power relations, uh, those that have got much stronger bargaining power uh, have more uh, power to determine the final outcome. So in the case of uh, expropriation without compensation, uh, it's very critical in our constitution, which we articulated in 1996, that there's a history and therefore embedded in our constitution is the concept of redress, which section 25 uh, talks to. However, when we've got a regime that we have since 1994, that has failed to fulfill a lot of the requirements on the equality clause of our constitution. You've got then a, a rise of desperation uh, with a view that uh, the inequality, poverty, and unemployment in Africa has worsened uh, since 1994. Therefore, how do you continue to become relevant and the expropriation of that comp uh, compensation becomes um, a straw uh, to hold on? And hence, the issue in this discussion is about how can we deepen access through a fast-growing economy, which will enable us to mobilize resources uh, which we can then uh, apply to society to improve the lives of many people. Excellent, thank you. And Mahlis, uh, extending to you the right that I denied to Davi here, why is Lunkile wrong or why is he right? He's, he's of course very right that there has to be a redistribution and we have a historical context of EWC which needs to be addressed and it should have been addressed a long time ago. My view is slightly different from Davi the economist. I come from the 
more the wealth management side and the wealth <coughs> of nations or wealth of people. And, and the way that the ANC is, is currently conducting this <coughs> process will threaten the wealth of everybody concerned, not only a group of people who have the land or property or in whichever form we are discussing it. It'll affect everybody else because you're trying to um, uh, solve one problem by creating a much bigger problem. And, and what both the gentlemen have, have, have touched on, Darby in particular, that we need the economic growth mm -hmm. to solve our problems of, of uh, imbalances in our society. And that's why we are sitting with the problems of imbalances. Our economy hasn't grown in 10 years. Can you imagine what would have happened if our economy had grown by 5%? Much of what we've been discussing today would be irrelevant. It will solve itself. Redistribution, affirmative action, all those things will fall away because the economy is growing. Now at a time when the economy is so severely wounded, comes the government and it wants to interfere even more in this process, thinking this is the cure for our mismanagement of 25 years. So this, if it, it's going the way it's going, will affect the wealth of everybody, rich and poor. And, and, the, and the outcome, three, five or 10 years from now, will be far more disastrously than we think it can be. Now, Darvi, does your approach of n no free lunch, you know, the trade, does it exclude redress as, as a possibility, as an option, as a motivation even? No, certainly not. Of course, there is much more, and Mkili is absolutely right. There are some social realities and some political realities in South Africa that we need to address. And Magnus is absolutely right. There are some other issues that we need to address that can be achieved only through one thing, and that is economic growth. And I would argue is that we can, if you really want to address things like, for example, unemployment, which I don't believe should be part of the, uh, part of the, the issues uh, that, that uh, where politicians should be involved in. I think the job of a politician is to first of all to look at our stuff, that means to protect private property rights and to protect us. That's the primary job of a government. But I believe once we do those primary jobs, we can get involved in other things. Mm -hmm. We can get involved in, to a degree of redistribution. I can't believe I said that, but yes. <laughs> uh, we have it on uh, camera, I do apologize. So maybe they can be the, the, and the reality in the end is, is that if you want to be, if you, if you are poor, is it better to be poor in a rich country or to be poor in a poor country? Mm -hmm. I'm not, of course I don't want poverty. Of mm -hmm. course I want, to, uh, want success. But what I absolutely know, and there's no, absolutely no doubt in my mind, that if you want success and you want wealth and you want to do something about unemployment and poverty, you must do the first thing first. And the first thing is to protect private property rights. That's absolutely essential to have in a success successful economy. Uh, Lungile, now, um, to take this discussion from the theoretical, from the broader themes, let's, let's make it, you know, uh, as real as we can. Let's say expropriation without compensation goes through, the constitution gets amendment, m amended, expropriation legislation is put through, and one of the people listening, one of the ordinary South Africans listening to this, uh, watching this discussion, um, they own a home and they perhaps have still a bond to pay off on that home. Now, let's say expropriation becomes that, you know, unfortunate reality. What's the next moment? What's the next experience of this homeowner? What can they expect, you know, that day, that month, that year perhaps? What's the pressing concern that an ordinary South African would face the moment EWC becomes something more than this debate? In fact, basically, you have a totalitarian regime where, as an individual, you own nothing because everything belongs to the state. Mm -hmm. Which we know in South Africa that there are elements uh, in South Africa who believe that the state should own everything, that the notion of private property, which is enshrined in our constitution, uh, should be pushed out aside because the state, according to these proponents, knows much better and can allocate much better than the market, which we all know is nonsense. Uh, particularly given the regime that we have in South Africa, which is going to capability uh, of delivering even a toilet to the poorest of the poor, not to mention a classroom where mm -hmm. kids go to school under a tree. So this is what we know about South Africa. We also know that this regime uh, which Magnus was talking to in the past 25 years, has destroyed quite a number of pivotal institutions that touch the lives of the poorest of the poor. Getting from Naledi in Soweto to Johannesburg, it used to be about the five minutes trip 
on the public rail commuter. It takes now four hours. So this is a dehumanization of many poor South Africans without any solution of how they address it. They now come with other issues to deviate from the key issues of implementing their crucial mandate, as, as, as Dad was saying, that you know, they need to implement what the law uh, and expects them, of, of them to do. And unfortunately, with failure of a regime led by the ANC, and until the electorate wakes up mm -hmm. and, and, and realizes that this is the reinforcement of inequality, of poverty, and the marginalization of black people, mm -hmm. because they've got no interest but the interest of a political party that's ruling today. Uh, to, to say with you, because I think that last remark is, is, is such an uh, uh, insightful uh, issue to explore, the, the racial discussion surrounding this. Do you believe that property rights in South Africa is something that one race cares about and another race doesn't care about, that one race benefits from and another race doesn't benefit from? Because I think that's the argument we often hear. It's a very false argument. Uh, South Africa is a constitutional regime, so with a constitutional order, and we signed up a unitary regime where we, we say very clearly in black and white in our constitution that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And with that, we also understand that there has been a history of dispossession and we've got laws that try to create that. Our biggest fault in South Africa are the political choices that the electorate has made, that you put a party that cannot do, it's very good in political slogan, but it's falls fall, fall short in terms of implementing the very same policies that the Commission expects it to. So really, here, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with our commercial order in, in terms of what we've written. Mm -hmm. It is to do the individuals that we choose to appoint or elect to run and effect the Commission. They just can't. And that has, been, has to be understood in its historical uh, context, in the sense that many of them have never even run any entity of their own. So these are people that come in who are pushing legislation, have never run a company, have never run mm. any entity. Suddenly, they've got billions and trillions to manage uh, mm. of a much bigger society. They've got to address different interests in society, those that you've mentioned, uh, that mm. are racial, that focus on other things, others are economical, others are unionist. Mm. With that, you're gonna fail. So we need a complete rethinking of, as electorate, as individual society about how do we ensure that we can put capable people, or at least if we don't have, how to enforce them to be accountable to the constitutional order. Davi, you seem like you have yeah. a remark mm. there too. I want to, I want to add to what uh, Mkiliev just said. You know, uh, I made a huge mistake, and that is that I thought that the ANC today is an ideologically driven organization. It is not an ideologically driven organization anymore. It used to be. Um, it's one thing to go into a debate with a socialist or with a communist because I know there's some thinking behind that. I know there's an ideology, there's a right thing behind it. There's usually one or two big thinkers or philosophers behind that, like Karl Marx or whoever you want to pick. So at least there's some sort of basis behind it. That's not what the ANC is anymore. It's not an ideologically driven organization. What it is, it uses ideology or it uses the rhetoric of ideology. It uses the words of socialism. But basically the ANC today exists for one reason and one reason only, and that is to live off the state. That's all that matters to the ANC. So don't for one single moment think that they're going to take people's assets and they're going to use it for that people. They're going to take those assets and they're going to consume that because that's the nature of the ANC today. Mm -hmm. It has become a destructive organization. It is not an ideologically driven or based organization anymore. Now, Magnus, uh, taking into account this, um, I think uh, some of my colleagues have, have heard ANC, high-ranking ANC people speak about a sustainable model of wealth extraction. Now, uh, I think that was slip in a moment of accidental truth, uh, but I mean, purely by coincidence, politicians have to uh, hit on the truth now and then. What does that mean for your ordinary South African? This ideological uh, current uh, pushing in one way, this push for redress, what does the, uh, these things meeting at the, de the, at the destruction of property rights, what does that mean to the everyday finances of a South African? 
Just <coughs> on that comment, I noticed that comment in one of your publications, and it's a very telling comment, that it is actually a deliberate plan to sustainably extract wealth from the haves and, and pass it on to the have-nots, which is, which is politically fine. All around the world, I think governments are trying to do that. But unfortunately, the, 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 um, <coughs> the ANC comes with a 25-year history of, of stuffing virtually up everything they've touched, SOE, SOEs, railways. Um, uh, so there's a massive distrust uh, from society and the middle class South Africans and from foreign investors that, you know, this is a very, very big project that the ANC is embarking on. I mean, expropriation without compensation, without a framework, without explaining how it's going to work in practice. So already we're paying the price in a, in, a, in a very silent way, but we can see the signs. Foreigners are extracting money from South Africa on, at, a, at a record level. The last five years, the numbers that I've got, Darby's got them, is 500 billion plus has flown quietly out of the country. You can pick it up in the numbers, yet there's very little discussion in the, in the general media about this and the impact on this. We see it already in the values of our stock exchange. Our stock exchange in five years has virtually grown by one or two percent per annum. We're seeing it in the price that we pay in our pension funds, where we have the restriction of Regulation 28, where for, you can only invest 30 percent into foreign markets. Most pension funds today, most people listening to this program, will have not have had an above inflation rate growth over five years and very soon for seven years. And then lastly, the property values in South Africa have collapsed. I'm not, I'm not joking, they've collapsed. Whatever we read about the real values, deduct 20%, 30%, 40%. Especially the top end of the market, and that was the more affluent class, mm -hmm. they, they, their property values could be anything. It can be a million rand, it can be five million, it can be seven million rand. They don't know because there's no market. So everything that is aligned to the property market, for instance, construction, development, architecture, new developments, have, have come to a standstill. And we're paying the price for the uncertainty that the ANC, the ANC has created from an economic and financial point of view. The, the rest of the world is telling us, you're going the wrong way. Wall Street Journal, Pompeo, they're all telling us quietly behind the scenes when you go to London, that is not going to work out very well for the average South African, black or white. Mm. And the ANC seems to be impervious to this, to this kind of advice. Davi, I'll come to you in a second, but I think it's very interesting, Magnus, that you touched Perhaps it's, uh, it's the government trying to intervene on our event here. Uh, your, uh, your, your bond has just been cancelled. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how does it feel? I mean, as, as you know, the, the pioneer, patient zero, as it were. Um, Martinus, when we're looking at, uh, at the word you mentioned there, pensions, regulation 28. Now, I'm going to try and mash a, a, in, in elegantly a question here that I had prepared um, into your remarks. Is uh, the looking at uh, prescribed assets and the floating, you know, the voluntary floating by Casato and some <coughs> union uh, bosses of the pension funds of their members making that available to, the, you know, the, the benevolent and loving hands of the state, is that something related to EWC or is that just EWC of another order or is that actual sound finances manager? No, it's not sound. It's actually part of the bigger overall picture. As Darby said, the extraction of resources to be consumed by the ANC. Land is one issue, or land in its, in its bigger def definition is one issue. The other one is your pension funds. We're sitting there with a very, very large pension pot, uh, 8 trillion, 9 trillion, 10 trillion. It is simply too irresistible for government not to try and find ways to get their hands into this kitty. And it's going to come in one way or the other. One gets the impression that between the pensions fund industry, government and Casato, they've already come to some kind of a deal how it's going to be dressed up. But the net result is going to be less growth for the average pension fund member who's largely ignorant about these kind of things who only is looking at a pension pot 20 or 30 years from now, who simply doesn't understand what a difference of only 1% growth per annum makes to the ultimate payout. Only 1%. It sounds innocuous. It's not a lot of money. Don't worry. It's a massive number. We're talking about already the pension funds are not producing growth because of all the factors that I've mentioned. So the second phase of this, this uh, sustainable extraction of wealth has to be the pension funds. It's sitting there waiting to be attacked in very subtle ways. 
No. So, yes, yeah. Lukin. So, uh, just to follow up on Mokna's point. So, in the, if in a constitutional regime, uh, recognizing the inequities that we have in our society, and we have a functioning state uh, where the state is accountable, politicians are accountable, and a government changes every four or five years as the condition allows us to. The discussion around prescribed assets to try and address infrastructure efficiency is a very good discussion to have. However, in a regime that we have, that we know very, very well, it can't look after its own finances. It can't look after public finances. It's ruined uh, a lot of our infrastructure. This becomes a very difficult position to have. Uh, that's the trust that I think we're struggling with the South Africans, is that we don't trust the regime where it can't even yeah. manage its own finances. Now it wants to manage my pension fund. No, China. <laughs> We're making a big mistake. It's interesting that you mentioned China. We might get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I think Mkili is making a very important point here, in a way. And that is that when you talk about the expropriation, everybody's talking about land. It's not about land. It's about something else. They're talking about the expropriation of land because land doesn't mean anything really. If you don't know what to do with the land, if you don't add capital to the land, if you don't add technology to the land, land is just, it's just land. It doesn't mean anything. But it's something more to this. It is, it is not only land, but it's all private properties. And in, in fact, prescribed assets to pension funds, it's exactly the same argument. So you can either steal somebody's private property, whether it's land or a house or whatever the case may be, or you can steal, you can prescribe the, some sort of prescription on, 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 on a pension fund. That is exactly the same argument. But the, you know, these sort of things, we've seen this movie before, and I can give you the steps. The step is, steps are you're gonna run out of taxpayers. Then you're gonna run out of capital. Capital, for example, we've consumed the capital at Eskom as an example. Then you're gonna run out of savers. And then eventually, the only thing that's left, you have to inflate yourself out of this nonsense. So that is where we Zimbabwe, they've gone through that already. That's Venezuela is at the moment. So you, uh, eventually, you run, as Margaret Thatcher has said, out of other people's money. And then the only alternative is to try to inflate yourself out of the trouble that you have caused. Now, if I might be uh, so uh, you know, brave as to depend on your clairvoyancy, looking at the budget, the upcoming budget, uh, you say there's the series, uh, taxpayers, savers. What's a red flag in the remarks that Minister Mboweni will make that the government is either anticipating a next step or trying to avoid it? What, what, you know, I, I think that might be a very you know, fuzzy question, Volhar uh, question, but is there, is there something that yep. from this budget we can you know, learn? I, th I don't think Tito Mouwen is going to be around that long. Uh, I think he's, he could be a socialist, but at least he's a pragmatist. So he's an uh, ideologue that you can have a debate with. He's got the experience as well, but he's in a very tough position here because he said, he did say many times before, that we need to do something about expenditure, the, the wage bill, the state-owned enterprises, close down South African airways and so on. Uh, and now the president comes with an announcement like, for example, we're going to have a sovereign wealth fund and we're going to have a state bank. Uh, we're going to continue with the NHI, that sort of stuff. There simply isn't money available for that. So the big, big red flag for me and with something that I'm very worried about is this sovereign wealth fund. What does this thing mean? And I'm concerned that what, what for example, now I'm just grabbing some, some ideas out of thin air. What if, for example, if we take government employment pension fund and ESCOM and South African Airways and the, reserve at the reserves at the South African Reserve Bank and one or two other picks and put them all into one big pot and we give that a name, we call it the sovereign wealth fund. That's what I'm concerned. If you start with this thing, that's called the sovereign mal fund. I'm telling you, that will be a huge uh, pot of gold. And believe me, if there's a pot of gold, the politicians will be waiting for it. Marcus? What, what is funny is that, you know, Tito has been tweeting, and it's quite, some of his tweets are very funny. He tweets, for instance, SAI is making a loss, close it down. So he tweets it, it's public knowledge, he's a minister of finance after all. Our president says, we can't close down SAI, it's an economic enabler. Wonderful word that he slipped in, and I suddenly saw this term pop up all over government, an economic enabler, at a massive cost to the taxpayer. I mean, it's just the thinking is, is so contradictory to your Minister of Finance. So I tend to agree with Darby that uh, Tito is not going to be around for, for too long, which would be disastrous in the current context. So this thinking of government, sovereign wealth funds and economic enablers, 
And already, and I can recall 10, 15 years ago, Trevor Manuel standing up in Parliament saying, this is the last money we'll ever give to SAA. I can remember the scene. And here we are, 60 billion rand later, and our president calls it an economic enabler. And yet we can't, as you say, provide toilets and, and, and railways. Just take that money and fix the railways in Gauteng and the Western Cape, and you'll already change the dynamics in, in those two very important regions. But we can't do that. The thinking is wrong. Yeah. So uh, a test case is, is to look at the government at uh, development finance institution. So you've got the Land Bank, you've got the IDC, you've got the DBSA, amongst others, quite a lot, even at provincial level. So do they disperse what they set out to disperse? Mm -hmm. And you find that they don't. In ordinary terms, uh, do they disperse what they set out to disperse? Yes. For uh, okay. some, someone with my economic background, which is worrying, what does that mean? It means these, uh, these are also uh, inherited institutions from the apartheid regime uh, who are very effective. Land bank around ensuring that there's food security by supporting a number of, uh, of white farmers at the time. Um, IDC similarly supporting manufacturers in, to ensure that we can try. So over years, if you go back and ask them uh, that what are your, how, how much do you plan to disperse, they probably tell you, IDC will say 22 billion rand. How much have you dispersed? Half of that. <coughs> so what I'm saying uh, around this uh, uh, new state bank, what is the problem? What are we trying to address? What's the problem that you want to fix? Yeah, what, what are you trying to address? A good example, another good example <laughs> is the Development Bank of South Africa giving South African Airways another Absolutely. bailout. This is a bailout. This is not bridging finance. Yeah. This is a bailout. Now, Lungkile, you are unfortunately somewhat pressed for time. We promise he's not being expropriated. <laughs> uh, he has other duties, and we are so lucky to have had his input. But perhaps on a last note. Our question today is how will EWC affect your budget? Now, I'm not going to be as, no, I am going to be as dramatic. You know, look down one of those cameras to one of our friends and try to give them some sense because what, how will the destruction of property rights affect their budget? Because these economic terms are fascinating and challenging, but if we're going to put it into the most simple considerations, what would those be? Yeah, firstly, um, those that have got mortgage may find themselves in deep trouble because the value-added tax is likely to be increased, meaning that what we had in the pocket will be much lesser, uh, and therefore you may have to uh, play around uh, with the disposable income that you had, and in certain cases, uh, pay Peter instead of Paul, uh, because there isn't much going around because government has taken some. More importantly also is what they do uh, with some of the products that Magnus uh, works on that relate to savings, that whether those might, not so, might also not be uh, attacked uh, in terms of the tax uh, going forward. But lastly, really, is the whole debate that the unions were very sensitive about. The idea uh, that, that was forcing the savers that when you retire, uh, you have to uh, buy annuity. And I know the unions don't want it. They want to cash out. So whether it brings it back, uh, the enforcement of, of these, some of these workers buying annuity, it's going to be interesting what happens to that. Thank you. Um, Lungile, just before you go, I would like to give this to you as a parting gift. Thank you so much. It is the brand new South Africa survey of the... IRR with all the data, and we had to put something positive on it. So uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's us raising the William Webb Ellis Trophy. Well, that's not really us, nice. but I mean, that's just a matter of time, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But thank you so Thanks much for your time. Thank you so much. Nice you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Right. Um, I'd like to take that further, the question that you posed. What will it do please. to uh, the budget, middle class wealth, and uh, consumer spending, et cetera, et cetera? It, it, it'll absolutely destroy it. If, if, if the sequence plays out the way one guess it's going to play out, where the banks are standing back and saying, you are still responsible. Your house, your property has been dispossessed, now belongs to somebody else, but we're not letting you off the hook. We, you're going to pay your bond. Whether there's some form of government guarantee going to come in, it'll immediately destroy, destroy discretionary expenditure. 
Because your balance sheet has just been halved. Discretionary expenditure. Well, money that you can spend every month. We, we are a comp we're a country that relies very greatly on consumer expenditure. 65, 70%. Uh, mm. Our clever friend here will tell us what the number is, but it's a big number. Mm. To keep the economy going, keeping people employed, we need people, middle class people, with money in their pockets to spend. That has already come to a standstill, even without the impact. Now, if you, if you, if you, if you extrapolate that, hundreds of thousands, even a couple of million people, middle class people, who've now lost their house, but they must still pay the property. It'll lead to financial chaos in this country. Mm. Will you carry on paying your bond? No, you won't. You walk away. You say, I'll take my chances with whatever's coming my way, but I will refuse to pay another cent mm. if my property happens to be dispossessed. So we're talking about a, a serious potential financial collapse. Yeah, you ask uh, Limkile, you know, if there's something, if you want to, if he wants to say something dramatic, here's something really dramatic. And that is that, you know, the, the reality is there are, Magnus, that the reality is there are many people out there, and ordinary people, that actually support expropriation. That is the reality. There are many people out there that ex support expropriation because they think, there's, you've got all these rich people, I have nothing, and there's nothing for me to lose. But I can tell you, and this is the dramatic part, I promise you, that if you don't, if you support expropriation because you don't like the rich people, you support expropri expropriation because you have nothing to lose. I promise you, one day when you do have something to lose, they're going to come after your assets as well. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's a bit like the, the Niemöller quote, I think. At first they didn't come for this because, yes, and yeah. I didn't say something because I wasn't to that. Mm. And when they came to me, there was no, no one else. left to, uh, to speak for me. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of the bank situation we've just touched on i think this m this this mortgage issue this bond issue <coughs> now we've heard a few uh, the the ir has been trying to uh, get these banks to speak up a bit to play some uh, some open cards uh, with their clients and we've received two very Im interesting bits of information the first thing is that under their understanding of the law you will be required to still pay the debt um, but the second thing that was recently said by, I think, uh, Kaskovadia of Barca was that they would be expecting the state, the government, to uh, make up for the 1.8 trillion rand black hole that might be blasted in the bank's books. So is this really an issue about expropriation without compensation, or is it an expropriation with compensation but just to someone else? No, in fact, our banking system, remember, a lot of these mortgages have been packaged and securitized and sold to foreign investors. I mean, the, the bank actually doesn't hold the bond anymore. It's probably some hedge fund in New York that now holds your bond, by the way. And you, as long as you pay, it's fine. But if, the, the minute there's a threat, now I've got international investors, but and very substantial ones involved, asking about, are we gonna get paid for our money that we bought from the South African bond, bond holder, or the bond grant in, in reality? And uh, that could lead to a run on the financial system. You're already starting to see signs about the banks the share price of our banks underperforming our market for a very long time. So the smart money is already starting to make their moves. It's the, it's the middle class, with all due respect to them, who doesn't watch these things and they, and they don't read beyond the, the, the Twitter quotes in the morning. Mm -hmm. The reality is that these things can all happen. You cannot discard them and saying it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Don't be emotional about it like J.P. Lantman. You cannot say that. Mm. Um, you have to say, in my scenario planning, there's a percentage uh, that I must put aside for losing everything, losing some of it, and, and right to the other extreme, I won't mm. lose anything, everything's fine. Mm. I don't believe it's going to be fine. We're already seeing the price. Our property market already is starting to bleed, bleed very seriously. And as in information comes out, um, as I say in Africa, on stick by stick, We'll start reacting, but the markets are smarter than us. Mm. The markets have already started to uh, price in a potential default of, mm. of, our, of our banking system to a small extent. And I know that the, the, the talking heads on media will say, ah, it'll never happen, don't worry, carry on. I don't believe that. There's the old saying, um, only the paranoid survives. So I think it's time to be paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a quote. Uh, Davi. Yeah, I, I think, uh, of course, all this, uh, I agree with you, but uh, quite, quite ironically, and this is what we do with our clients, is that we realize there's a lot of risk out there. And we realize we need to somehow mitigate this risk. And, we need, and, we, and that's what we try to do with our clients. Even, even if the expropriation never happens, even if the constitution is never changed, the mere fact 
that they mention this, that they're talking about you it. Have means to, you have to consider it. We, and not only do we have to consider it, we actually do consider yes. it. Yeah, we, we actually start changing the, 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 the portfolios of our clients. We, for example, part of the advice is, and of course the sums have to add up, go to the bank and take out a loan against your property because then the bank, in a way, carries some risk indirectly with you. That's one example. So we, in order to, to, to address all these sort of risks, we start doing things that are not necessarily productive to the economy in order to address the potential risk of expropriation, as an example. And there are many other examples. You can make, all, make use of all sort of complicated structures that are very, very expensive in order mm -hmm. to protect your private property rights, something that shouldn't actually be necessary. That's costing us a lot of money. It's adding to the uncertainty. And that's money that could have been used so much better in growing the economy. I can, I can agree. I mean, we invest in the same business. What we've seen the last three to five years especially in the last year, it's just this massive outflow of capital. It's defensive measure by middle-class South Africans who are trying to protect the capital. Mm -hmm. Under different circumstances, they would be opening up a business, buying another property, or, or, or a second or a third property as an investment. That has come to a standstill. So it's a very defensive measure, which has worked out in their favor, but it's non-productive. We're exporting our capital and it's all sitting in other countries' investments, and not in South Africa. These are the things that the politicians conveniently choose to ignore, or don't wanna, or just cover it up, it's not, it's not important, it's not, these are very important issues. A lot of the things that we discuss here are also being discussed in London, mm -hmm. Frankfurt, New York, and all those places. We've uh, spoken about, you know, uh, pension, how your pension might be, how your investments might be vulnerable, how uh, your relationship with your bank, your finances. Now, an interesting thing that the IRR has been trying to do and will continue pursuing is this idea of insurance. Will uh, South Africans be able to insure their property against expropriation without compensation. Now, you say that, that these people should go to the bank and you know take uh, matters into their own hands. Is there some worth mm -hmm. in clients of insurance companies in South Africa saying, well, you're going to insure me against normal theft. How about, let's call it government theft? Yeah, well, I, I, I think Michael, I, I'm sure Magnus can help me out here, but as far as I know, you can't really insure against political risk like this. But having said that, and this is actually one of the measures that can be put into place to protect you. Uh, having said this, you can actually make use of different kinds of insurance. If you make use of international insurance against this sort of political interference in private property rights, for example, you can get foreigners to put some pressure on government to, to not to do these sort of things. Or something else, get a foreigner to take a stake in your local business and it will be so much more difficult for government to steal your local business because another government, there's some international agreements between government Governments, international. So you can get international, um, uh, uh, international law to protect your local property rights as well. So all those sort of measures are available as well. But as far as I know, local political insurance, that is not available to us. Magnus. You're going to need a reinsurer somewhere in Europe that will calculate the risk and say, yes, we will underwrite that policy or we won't underwrite that policy. Mm -hmm. But the point that Darby makes is that, yes, we're all talking about South Africans owning property. But remember, there are lots of very wealthy Foreigners who own property in South Africa, especially Western Cape, game, game farms, hunting farms. And, and, and one hears about Indian investors who put in a billion rand in the France Hook area. Now, that's the kind of thing, that's when the, you know, the, the trouble is going to start. If government starts attacking those kind of properties, we're talking substantial amounts of money and very influential international business people. What is going to happen? I think it's just such a dangerous path that we're on. Can I add to that? And that's the intellectual property right protection. Mm. In the intellectual property right, if the president is not signed that legislation... Still lying on his desk here. If he signs that, if the Americans are going to get very angry at us. Now, like the Americans or not, that's not important. It's the biggest economy in the world. They're doing us a lot of favors. We're exporting uh, under very, uh, very favorable conditions to the United States. If we sign that piece of legislation, I'm very concerned that these benefits that we currently get from the Americans, that's going to disappear as well. And that's nothing but expropriation. Whether it's physical or non-physical goods, it's the same thing. It's about private property rights. I will soon uh, open up uh, uh, to uh, you know a few questions, perhaps from some of the journalists present, uh, some of the esteemed members of the IRR, like Dr. Anthea Jeffrey and Mr. Ian Cruikshank. So, if you want to ask some questions, get some input, uh, please feel free to prepare these. Um, in terms of, and, and then I will, I will of course come to you, and we can put the questions to these uh, fine gentlemen.
Now, uh, looking at the outflow of capital and looking at these issues, is there this risk, I think you touched on it earlier on inflation, is there this risk of uh, the government deciding, well, we need money, let's print some more money. Is that another, is that fatalism, is that alarmist? No, 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 no certainly not alarmist. In fact, we've saw the, uh, the, we, the, a certain faction within the ANC already attacking a South African Reserve Bank in terms of ownership, and we all know it's not about the ownership, it's about the mandate of the Reserve Bank. That's what they're after. But I've, I've mentioned the steps, you go through your taxpayer, you go through capital, you go through the savers, and eventually you've got so much debt, you can't get rid of this debt, and the only way to get rid of this debt is through, to inflate <coughs> it that way. And, and one of the best things that the president has done, and let's be, let's, be, let's be frank about this, he hasn't done that many good things, but one of the best things that he's done is reappointed Lesetja Kanyafu as the governor of the South African Reserve Bank. And I think he is probably one, if not the best, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank that we've ever had. He's got three jobs. He's supposed to have two jobs. He's got three jobs. The one is to protect the, the South African Reserve Bank from the interference from the politicians. And for now, it seems as if we've sort of done that. Uh, it's come, it's going to come back, I promise you. They're going to come back, and they're going to go for the Reserve Bank again. But for now, that seems to be over for now. The two other jobs is to get inflation down mechanically, and he's done that to an extent, inflation 4.5%. Uh, that he's done that because of keeping interest rates relatively high. And even more importantly, get inflation expectations down. And that has been happening recently as well. So he's done a really a brilliant, a brilliant job. I promise you, and he's going to be there for the next five years. But eventually the debt levels will reach such levels is that the politicians with the pressure on him will just build up and build up and build up until something goes. And eventually inflation will be the problem. And inflation is a monster that we do not want in South Africa. Imagine having, with all the problems that we have, also have inflation so about 10% or so on top of that, then this would have been a real disaster already. Mm. One of, one of my hobbies is watching a, a website called national, nationaldebts.org. And it gives the national debt of all the countries in the world live. So you can click onto any country you like and you can see the debt and it ticks over very fastly. A year ago, South Africa's international debt went through the 3 trillion rand for the first time. Now, I tweeted on that and it got a massive reaction. It was tweeted, geez, that can't be true. Well, a year later, I checked it this morning, it's 3.34 trillion. In one year, our debt has gone up by 334 billion rand. Now, each and every South African in this country now owes 60 odd thousand rand the day they are born. It's already about 13% of our budget is, is being put aside to repay that debt. And a downgrade can make it worse because the interest rates might go even higher although the fact it's already high. So it could be 15%, which is non-productive money, just paying old debts. You're not building railways or sewage lines or whatever. That's the debt trap that we're moving towards. And then the, the, the scenario that Darby has sketched, which could play out over five to 10 years, could play out over three years. That's our scenario right now. Currently, the rate at which the debt to GDP ratio is going up is roughly about 5%. There are a number of factors contributing to that. It's not only the fiscal deficit, there are things like the exchange rate, like inflation, and that sure, that's sort of stuff. Quite correct. But, yeah. but, but, but the, 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 it's roughly about 5%. The debt is going up at the rate of around about 5%. And then, of course, the debt that you, that you accumulated the last year, the past year, you need to pay interest on that the next year as well, making pushing the deficit even bigger, pushing debt levels even higher. So uh, we are, without a doubt, in a fiscal debt spiral. And if we don't take very, very uh, difficult decisions now and implement those decisions, and that means austerity, there's nothing else. You have to get people, make people angry. That's the only option. We don't have an option of ma not making people angry anymore. With that, I mean you have to spend less money on people. You have to fire people because there's no other way out. I think making people angry is something the IRR sometimes quite excels at. Um, but I, I think it, to, to go back to Thatcher, I think it was, it was uh, she, she said that you, uh, compassion can only take you so far, you need hard cash. And in terms of, I think we see it with regards to the power situation in Soweto, with many of these uh, uh, spending issues where the government has been kicking the can down the road, trying to uh, cover, I think, some political bases. The absence of load shedding before last year's election comes to mind as an example of that. Now, on this austerity uh, project that, uh, that Titumbuweni should, in our view, launch on or should uh, you know, cut these expenditure uh, levels, 
what's the thing that the South African citizen, reading some phrases from the budget, come Thursday, come Friday, what should be signs of Mr. Mbuweni is uh, doing the right thing, or Mr. Mbuweni is kicking the can still further down the road? It's a, it's a tricky, there are many questions in one, and then I must just tell you, there are lots of questions. <laughs> the thing is, I, mean, I think it'll take a day or two to realize, and you get smart guys like David who go through the numbers, because what normally happens on budget day, it just, the news is just pumped out, and all the headlines, and they focus on the taxes. Yeah. But then the clever guys start analyzing the bigger numbers, the macro numbers, the, B, the budget before deficit, and, and the, the loans, et cetera. That you, that's the stuff that one needs to look at. But we'll, we will very quickly find out if, Mbaweni has been able to slow this runaway train called the government service, where you have 29,000 people earning a million rand plus. I mean, it's just unsustainable. So we will quickly find out whether, which direction we're going to go, and more importantly, the markets will tell us very quickly. They're not stupid. They will work it out very So despite what the president will say and the minister of finance, the markets will quickly work this out. They go through the numbers and say, we're on the right road, or we're again kicking the, the can down the road. And I, my, my, my money is on the, on the can getting a hefty blow on, on Wednesday. Let me, let me give you this. Uh, it's a wrong question. Because I tried, this is what I tried to say earlier, is that the ANC is not an organization based on some sort of ideology. The ANC is an organization that lives off the state. It is really as simple as that. And for that simple reason, Titumbu Weni will not be allowed to cut state spending. He will try. He will certainly try to cut spending. And he'll pretend spending. that he's cutting And he's going to be a pretend. And he may even be successful here and there. But he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that because he will not be allowed to do that. Yeah. And he's either going to jump and go and look after his avos or he's going to get pushed. Uh, but I think that one thing that really stands out for me, and this is, the, the, this is the, the elephant in the room that's not going to be addressed, I'm afraid to say. <clears throat> Maybe I'm going to be wrong. Let's see. But I really doubt that. And that's Eskom's funding. Eskom is in serious deep trouble. We all know that. Eskom needs 250 odd billion rand. They need it now. So where, where's the money going to come from? Either they're going to borrow the money, the state can, and the state in fact can borrow another 300 or so in the financial market. It's possible. It's yeah. going to come at a price, yeah. but it's possible for them, to, for them to borrow another 250, 300 billion. It will lead to a downgrade, without a doubt, and give the money to Eskom. So that is certainly a possibility. With the downgrade, it's the price that you're going to pay high in, in, interest rates going with that as well. But I think, I think that, that the minister is not going to address that. And that's the issue. I thought in the medium term budget last year, he will address that. He did not. Yeah. I thought in the SONA, the president was going to address it. He did not. I thought, um, I th think, well, he should have he should address it in the, in the budget speech. He's probably not going to address that. So I think he's going to kick that can, can down the road again. And it's exactly the same as South African Airways. They kicked down the can and down the road. They ran it into the ground. They kept on force feeding it with all these transfers for the 11, 11 turnaround attempts that mm -hmm. they've had. And eventually, they did not put South African Airways into uh, business rescue. They were forced to put South African Airways into business rescue. It wasn't, of course, technically it was the, the minister that put SA Airways, but it is a trade union that forced them to do this. This is what they're going to do. So they're not going to resolve the issue. Mm. They're not going to bite the bullet. Mm. That's the issue. And the markets know this. We're waiting. I think ESCOM, as far as I'm concerned, is that one major outstanding issue in the short term. Well, absolutely, and as you pointed out, uh, that the growth for the next five years is going to be below 1% because we simply don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. and, and as Davi says, we need to resolve it. We're going to pay for it one way or the other. We have this catastrophe that needs to be resolved, and it's going to cost a humongous amount of money. And, and I don't know why this quote of Ernest Hemingway jumps into my head. You remember we said in The Sun Also Rises, how did you, get, how did you go broke? Slowly at first. And then suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how far are we away from suddenly? We're very close because Moody's is sitting out there wait, wait, waiting and watching. And they've, they, they've kind of not uh, impressed the markets, but the market is a little confused why they haven't acted. They've been very, very uh, 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 giving us the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Budget after budget, they said, let's wach let's wait a little bit. But at some point, to, to protect the uncredibility, they'll have to downgrade us. And that's when we're going to feel the pain in various formats, stock exchange, currency, and, and bond prices, et cetera. And I think it's just the smart people on the stock exchange. It's your pension fund. Mm -hmm. 
will be affected. You know, these sort of things, of course, suddenly, things can happen suddenly. We've seen it many times. Suddenly the rand blew out. Suddenly the bond market can blew out, blow out. So that sort of thing certainly can happen yes. suddenly. But, you know, South Africa is a, is a country with very, very liquid and very sophisticated, well-regulated financial market, sophisticated economy. There's a lot going for the There are many institutions still standing. Reserve Bank again. Mm. And the, the press, certainly. The judiciary, that sort of stuff. And that's not stuff that's going to end tomorrow morning. But without a doubt, we're putting totally unnecessary strain on what we still have left. And mm. gradually, the one pillar is going to fall after the other one, and eventually this party always ends the same, and it's with very high levels of inflation. And perhaps as uh, to, to bring um, this, this, this airplane of discussion perhaps to the landing, um, the, the issue of you know, the basic things that people spend money on, your food, clothing, footwear, Taking a step back and looking at these broader economic themes, taking into account EWC, I think people watching our discussion can perhaps anticipate the answer to this question, but what will happen to the price of food, clothing, and footwear here in South Africa? If, for example, expropriation for ex uh, without compensation just goes ahead um, as, as the ANC and its ideological or perhaps wealth extractionary allies, would seek. It can happen on so many levels. First of all, from the consumer's point of view, you're forced to pay for a property that doesn't belong to you. So that's an amount of money that it just disappears out of your discretionary spending. So that's from the consumer's point of view. That'll fall away. If we're talking about the big farms, the producers of food, the suppliers of the products that you're talking about, and they impacted, they can't get uh, loans to fund their next crop, you'll have a supply um, a shortage of, and you'll physically start seeing a shortage of potatoes, of bananas, of maize, of meat, because how can you keep on producing? If you're a big farmer, you need the funding. And, and that's what I think government doesn't realize. As Davi was saying, a piece of land by itself is just a piece of land. It's what's the productive value, what you put in, the farms, the, the equipment, the, the farming enterprise, and the finance behind it all. And that's the danger, is that that whole financial mechanism, which is very sophisticated but very fragile, can be undone very, very quickly. And then you'll have shortages in, in, in our supermarkets. Mm. And it will lead eventually to things like low, weak economic growth and mm. high unemployment, high poverty, high inflation and stuff like that. But let's also not be too alarmist. Yes. And, you, and that is that I don't believe that even if the constitution is amended, I don't believe the politicians are going to start stealing property the next day. They will have to steal one or two farmers for the symbolic value thereof. So it will happen. Mm. Uh, but I don't think they're going to start stealing all properties. Mm. But they will be able to. A, a, a or they will be able to, mm. and gradually it will build up a momentum without a doubt. But it's not going to happen, mm. even after uh, the but, amendment. But I just the main, my main issue, let me just mention this, my main issue is not necessarily that. What I'm very concerned about is the heat that's created around yeah. that. Yeah. And that people are going to simply fall in and take other people's property and the, polit the, the police and the politicians are not going to do anything about that. Yeah. So of course there's a state that's going to take stuff and steal stuff. But they're probably going to not do the rest either. They're not going to look after your, the, the remaining of private property rights that's still out there. Well, I'm glad Darby's not as paranoid as I am, but it reminds me of that quote. The fact that you're not paranoid doesn't mean they won't get you as well. <laughs> <laughs> There's this wonderful uh, story about Winston Churchill sitting at dinner uh, next to a lady, and, and he says, and they're not getting along well, and he says, Madam, will you sleep with me? for a million pounds. And she said, oh, Mr. Churchill, I think we can, I think so, yes. And a bit later he says, Madam, will you sleep with me for 10 pounds? And she says, Mr. Churchill, what kind of woman do you think I am? And he said, well, I thought we'd already fixed that issue. Now we're just <laughs> haggling over the price. <laughs> so on that note of my brilliant per per uh, Churchill impersonation, uh, let us throw this open to some questions. Mm -hmm.